to the book of James. <clears throat> book of James, chapter 5. Which means we are at the tail end of the book of James. Um, we have tonight and next Wednesday. And then we're finished um, for the spring quarter. So I'm hoping to finish the book of James um, next week. So the book of James, as you know, the first part of the book is about the walk of faith in the Christian. So the Christian that's saved by faith needs to learn how to walk by faith. And that involves accepting God's vantage point on trials, uh, obeying God's word, not showing favoritism, doing good works, and then controlling the tongue. So again, these are things not to make you a Christian. Um, these are things that we do as Christians, and that's called growth. And then the second part of the book of James, which starts about the middle of chapter 3 and goes to the end of the book, is about the walk of wisdom. Wisdom is defined there at the end of chapter 3. It's knowledge applied. So wisdom is demonstrated by her actions. And then James, in the last two chapters of the book, applies wisdom to every area of our life. How do we apply divine wisdom to our spiritual life? Beginning of chapter 4. How do we apply wisdom to our commercial life? End of chapter 4. How do we apply wisdom to the use of wealth? Beginning of chapter 5. And then last week, um, how do we apply wisdom to waiting for the imminent return of our Lord? That's in chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. Covered that last time. So tonight, and you'll notice here from this outline, we've only got two topics left. Um, tonight, we're going to try to cover the whole issue of prayer. So wisdom as it applies to our prayer life. Because the expectation of God is that we should be um, a praying people. So that's in chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. So the first part of it, according to our outline here, is the kinds of prayer. Verse 13 through about the middle of verse 16. And then once you get it to the end of verse 16... All the way through verse 18, it's about the power of prayer. I mean, does prayer really work? Does prayer really move God's hand? So let's start here with the kinds of prayer. Um, there's a lot of mental mindset out there that, and I thought this way a lot before I became a Christian, I thought there was just like a standard prayer. So you have a, you know, you get a prayer, maybe you can order it off the internet, and you just sort of repeat some words, and that's what prayer was. Um, but that whole mindset goes directly against what Jesus taught about prayer, because Jesus said, and when you are praying, now notice he doesn't say if you are praying, this is in Matthew 6 verse 7. When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So paganism is sort of characterized by just mindlessly repeating verbiage. And that's not at all what the Lord has in mind for prayer. Uh, prayer is basically conversation. It's your opportunity to speak to God. God has his opportunity to speak to you primarily through his word. But 
any healthy relationship has two-way communication. So God talks to us through his word and we talk to him through prayer. So, you know, if you're having marriage problems, um, the first question a marriage counselor will ask, who's worth his or her salt, is what is your communication like in your marriage? Yeah, we're married, and, but I haven't talked to my wife in three, three months. Oh, well, therein lies the problem. Um, there has to be healthy communication taking place for any relationship of any kind to develop marriage or otherwise. And if you're not in the word consistently, you're not really giving God a chance as a Christian to talk to you. And if we don't have regular prayer life, um, we're not really giving ourselves a chance to talk to God because we're analogized to bride and groom. He's the groom, we're the bride. That's a very intimate relationship. And obviously for that kind of relationship to work, there has to be healthy two-way communication. So I don't know, have you ever been around somebody or had a so-called friend where you did all the talking and they never talked? And then there's the opposite. You run into people and they don't let you talk at all. And those really are imbalanced relationships. Uh, what God has for us is a, is a two-way street here. So we know how he talks to us through his word, but now James says if you want to really grow in your spiritual life, you have to develop a healthy prayer life. So what he starts off with here are the kinds of prayer. And by my count, there's five kinds. Maybe there's more mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, but these are the five that James is focused on. So different kinds of situations call for different types of prayer. You know, we don't approach God with the exact same format in prayer every single time. It's the type of prayers that we pray are totally dependent on the circumstances. So James here identifies five different circumstances which bring forth five different kinds of prayer. So the first one is in verse 13. It's the prayer of dependence when you're under affliction. So notice what he says there in verse 13. James chapter 5 verse 13. Is there anyone among you suffering? See, what do you, what do, you do when you suffer? Uh, well, most of us complain, but James doesn't say, is there anyone suffering? Start complaining. What he says is, is there any among you suffering? Then he must not should or try this out and see if it works, but he must pray. So the first kind of prayer is the prayer offered unto God where you're acknowledging your dependence upon God. And you need help with your circumstance. And you need help because you're under affliction. There's circumstances in your life that are bigger than you. And so if you're in that position, you pray a prayer of dependence. Um, I very much like what Luke 18 verse 1 says. Jesus is speaking and it says, Now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times men ought to pray and not to faint. <laughs> men ought to pray and not, or not, and not lose heart. So rather than fainting or losing heart, which is very easy to do when you're afflicted, it's to pray to God. I think Paul the Apostle prayed one of these kinds of prayers. When he was under affliction, he prayed a prayer of dependence, you know, the Lord, Lord help me in other words. And he did this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, where he says, because of these surpassing greatness of the revelations, and here he's talking about 14 years prior 
he was caught up into the third heaven. And he saw, he heard things that a man is not fit to hear. So he says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, because of these surpassing, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself. Because if you were caught up to the third heaven and you heard things that, that ordinary people don't hear, wouldn't you be a little puffed up? I mean, we would all kind of be that way, wouldn't we? So God obviously didn't want that to happen to Paul. So to, to, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. So God allowed a problem into Paul's life to keep him humble on account of these surpassing revelations. And whatever this thorn was, and nobody really knows, there's a lot of opinions, but that's just what they are, their opinions. I know this much that it hurt, whatever it was, because he mentions it as a thorn, which obviously was painful. Is he talking about physical pain, emotional pain, or relational pain? We're not told. So he was under these circumstances. He was afflicted by this. And so he prayed this prayer of dependence. And he says, concerning this, the thorn in the flesh, in other words, I implored, which is a strong word, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. So he asked God three times to take whatever it was agitating him away. And God, as you travel through that paragraph, says, no, I will not take it away because this thorn is keeping you humble and dependent upon me and usable. But my power is made perfect in weakness, is what God says. Um, in other words, God gave Paul grace to bear up under it. So many times, you know, we'll ask God to take something away and God says, no, I'm not going to take it away, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the grace or the strength to bear up under it. So that's what Paul received there in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 and 8. But you'll notice that he's illustrating here for us this prayer of dependence because he was afflicted. Then James outlines a second prayer for us, a prayer of praise for the person that's happy. Uh, from the word happy, we get the word happenstance or luck or circumstance. So something has gone well in your life. Uh, maybe you got a raise or a new job or uh, you got a better grade on the test than you thought you were going to get or something like that or a, a door is open for you and you're just, you're just happy about it. So James says if that's your situation, then pray a prayer of praise unto God. And you see that there in the second half of verse 13. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing. Notice God likes music because it says sing here. My wife lets me sing in the shower, but that's it, right? But singing is biblical. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises to God. So he gives here a second kind of prayer. Something in your life happened favorable, then praise the Lord with that. Take, take that to the Lord and bless him. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So we should be people like that all the time anyway, shouldn't we? Because we already have wonderful things. Uh, not the least of which is our salvation in Jesus Christ. So if you're afflicted, prayer of dependence. If you're happy, pray a prayer of praise. And now James verses 14 and 15 outlines a third prayer. And this has to do with someone that is sick or ill. Something's wrong with the physical body. What's that kind of person supposed to do? 
while they are supposed to summon the elders for the elders to pray for them. So notice what he says here in verses 14 and 15 as he outlines this third kind of prayer. He says, is any among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Look at that. And if he has committed any sins, they will be forgiven of him. So this, uh, there's a lot of ways you can go wrong interpreting this. So let's spend just a few moments here. You'll notice the first part of verse 14, is any among you sick? In other words, something is wrong with the body. Then he, obviously, or she, must call for the elders of the church. So you'll notice that a flock, and this is a, actually an interesting verse on church government. You know, how do you govern a church? Um, who makes the decisions in a church? And we believe that the proper understanding of it is uh, what we would call elder rule, which basically means that the church is governed by a plurality of godly men. You'll notice that elders there is plural. So a lot of churches, um, when you go to a church and want to join a church, you probably should try to figure out what, what is their philosophy of government. A lot of churches are bishop ruled, meaning you have a bishop that's ruling over multiple churches. That's the model I grew up with in the Episcopalian system. Um, some churches are congregational rule, um, but we believe that the best Biblical support in the New Testament is for elder rule, meaning that a church is governed by a plurality of godly men. It doesn't say how many you have to have, um, but there has to be a plurality of them. So that's what we have here at Sugarland Bible Church. We think that's the model that's uh, best represented in the New Testament. Um, interesting study on the doctrine of elders, Acts 14, verse 23, Paul on his missionary journeys. It says, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they entrusted them to the Lord to whom they had believed. So Paul, as he went off on his first missionary journey, he planted churches and he planted elders within those churches. Acts 16 and verse 4, it says, Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the ordinances for them to follow, which they had determined by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. So the big decision in Acts 15 was made by the elders, it says. Titus uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Titus, Paul writes to Titus and says, For this reason I left you in Crete, which, by the way, is a little tiny island in the Mediterranean Sea in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I've actually, my wife and I have actually been there. It's, it's nice today because it's all built up with all the touristy stuff. But that was... Titus's first assignment as a pastor, he was put off in this island, and he was supposed to govern these house churches, and Paul tells Titus on Crete, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Philippians chapter 1 verse 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers, which is the word for elders, overseers and deacons. So probably the early churches were patterned after the synagogue. And that's how the synagogues for the Hebrews, the Jewish 
people in the diaspora were set up, a plurality of godly men. And so Christianity coming out of that with its early churches was set up uh, the same way. By the way, there's no problem with having a leader amongst the elders. Acts 18 and verse 8 of the synagogue says Crispus, the leader of the synagogue. So a lot of people have gone, I think, a little too far with an elder rule mentality where they're almost afraid of a pastor. They kind of view it as their job to keep the pastor, you know, poor and humble kind of thing. And um, that's probably reactionary the other way. Because some people have escaped churches where the pastor has become a tyrant. And so they go to another church and they want to make sure the pastor has no authority at all. And there's nothing wrong with the pastor being one of the elders. There's nothing wrong with the pastor even being the leader amongst the elders. If indeed this is patterned after the synagogue. Um, And Crispus was the leader of the synagogue. And these early churches were most likely patterned after the synagogue. But the best support you have in the New Testament for church governance is a plurality of godly men. And so when someone is sick, what are they supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to summon this leadership group within the church. Uh, By the way, we don't see in the New Testament this idea where Elders are ruling over Sugarland Bible Church and then some other church and then the other church down the street because sometimes we get emails from people saying, what, what should we do in this matter? What is your ruling? And the fact of the matter is God hasn't given us any authority over the church down the street. We have enough problems, thank you very much, in our own church. <laughs> we can make suggestions but we have no authority to go outside the church and start decreeing what other churches do. But if someone in this flock is sick, one of the things they could do is to pray, is to summon the elders. Then the elders are to come. And what does it say here? They, that's the elders, the leaders of the church, they are to pray over him anointing with an, with oil in the name of the Lord. So anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Oil would symbolize healing. Oil would symbolize the Holy Spirit. Where does this idea come from? It comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 13. You'll see it there in the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. It says they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. So if someone is sick and they want prayer, they should summon the elders. The elders of that particular church should go to that person and pray over them and should actually anoint their head with oil. And what will God do? Look at verse 15. And the prayer offered in faith, so it's a a sign of faith to do this because you're acknowledging dependence upon God. The prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Now, this needs to be handled with a lot of care because some people take this to mean that if you do this and you summon the elders and they come and they anoint the the head with oil and pray over that person, then God is obligated to make that person well. It's like a formula that has to work every single time. And that is not what the Bible as a whole teaches on the subject. A lot of people are quoting Isaiah 53, verse 5, which is a prophecy of Jesus, which says, by his wounds we are healed. And they take that to mean that healing is guaranteed in the atonement. 
if you're a Christian, you should not get sick. And if you are sick, it means you don't have enough faith because you haven't summoned the elders to come and anoint your head with oil and pray over you. When you build any doctrine, you can't just look at this verse or one verse. You've got to look at the totality of divine revelation on the subject. So let me give you some other verses that have to be factored in here to understand this properly. One of them is 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, which says, If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So is it God's will that some people remain sick? Yes, it is. Is it God's will that some people are healed? Yes, it is. It just depends on the circumstance and how God is dealing with that individual circumstance. For example, Paul the Apostle did not have all of his illnesses healed. Because Paul says in Galatians 4, verse 13, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness, this is Paul speaking, that I preached the gospel to you for the first time. So you can't say Paul didn't summon the elders and he didn't have enough faith. We're dealing here with the Apostle Paul. And remember I showed you earlier 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, where he had the thorn in the flesh. And he implored the Lord three times that it might leave. And God said to me, Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. In other words, God told Paul, I'm not going to heal you of this thorn. But I am going to give you the grace to stand up under it because the thorn is necessary to keep you humble. Um, 1 Timothy 5 verse 23, Paul says to Timothy, a pastor in Ephesus, do not go on drinking water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So obviously, Timothy, under Paul's direction, didn't have all his diseases immediately healed. Paul, in his last letter, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 20, says, Erastus remained at Corinth, but I left Trophimus sick at Miletus. So not even Paul the Apostle healed Everybody, Here, here's a man named Trophimus that he left sick at uh, Miletus. So when you look at James chapter 5, verse 14, you know, the prayer offered in faith um, will restore him, the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. You can't just build your doctrine of healing from that one verse. You've got to look at all of these other verses that I've tried to factor in. And when you, when you take a look at all of these verses, what you learn is, yes, God does heal. But he doesn't heal everybody. Uh, Some people he allows to remain sick for whatever reason. And this is very different than the teaching that you're getting on so-called Christian television, which is the prosperity gospel, which is the idea that your healing is guaranteed. You just have to have enough faith to access it. So the prosperity gospel is a horrible doctrine for the simple reason that it promises people something that God hasn't guaranteed. And so if someone, you know, is in a wheelchair or has some sort of, you know, problem and people pray over them and they never get better, if they're under prosperity teaching, then not only do they have to go through life in that wheelchair, but they have to go through life thinking that the reason that they're in that wheelchair is they don't have enough faith, which is like double jeopardy when you think about it. I mean, dealing with an infirmity is hard enough, 
And it's worse when someone tells you that you're in that condition because you put yourself there because you don't have enough faith. So that's why this subject of healing has to be approached, you know, with a, a lot of care or you can do damage to people. I do have some good news in it, though. The day will come when every disease will be healed. That will happen, though, not this side of the second coming, but the other side of the second coming when we're in our resurrected bodies. And it says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There, Revelation 21 verse 4, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain for the first things have passed away. So in that sense, healing is guaranteed in the atonement on the other side of the second coming. But until then, we're living in a fallen world where we get sick we get ill, we get old, and when we find ourselves in those circumstances, we need to, act, we need to summon the elders, uh, anoint the sick person's head with oil, as the book of James says, and pray for the person to get well. And as we do that, we say to ourselves, if we ask according to his will, he, he, he hears us. We don't do that as some sort of guarantee ordering God to heal such and such a person because we don't think healing is guaranteed in the atonement this side of the second coming because clearly God does heal today but clearly he does not heal in every single circumstance there are all kinds of ways God is working in people's lives that we're not necessarily privy to so here at Sugarland Bible Church, we've, we've had some circumstances where um, someone has come to us as elders and they've wanted their head anointed with oil and we've prayed for them. And I have to be honest with you, um, we've had limited success with it. Um, there was a situation here before I got here where a person actually was healed when that happened. There have been other circumstances where the prayer is just as fervent and the person did not get healed. Um, and so when the latter happens, we just say, well, the Lord is in charge. And we're just going to give this situation over to the Lord. So that's why we, when we deal with verses like this, we have to be very careful about it because we don't want to wrongly teach God's word and make it sound as if God is making promises that he's not making. But here he's describing a situation where it is his will to heal somebody. And it says if that's the circumstance, then God will raise the person up. Now, you'll notice the second part of verse 15. It says, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. So the implication here is very clear that this person was sick because of sin. So here we go again. We've got to be real careful on how we're presenting this. Apparently, sometimes sickness is attributable to sin. Some people are sick because of sin in their lives some sort of habitual pattern of sin. And I would say that's what's happening here. Um, you'll find an identical situation in John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 5, where there was a man who had been ill for 38 years. He was a paralytic. Paralytic, remember? And he was there by the pool of Bethesda. Uh, I've actually been to the remains of where they believe this pool is. And there sat a man for th 38 years. That's a long time. And he was uh, incarcerated physically. He was incarcerated spiritually because he didn't know Jesus. And he was bound up by superstition because when you read John 5, what it says is there was a superstition that an angel would come and stir the pool of Bethesda up. And, you know, as long as you could be the first one 
to make it into the pool, you'd be healed. Well, that's a horrible thing if you can't move your body, right? How could you ever be the first one into the pool? So you can see the total infirmity that this man was in bound up to pagan strange ideas, uh, superstition, uh, physically limited, separated from God. And Jesus, what did Jesus do? Jesus went and healed him. And you read about that in John 5. It's one of the great seven signs that Jesus performed there in John's gospel. But then Jesus said something very interesting to him when, when all was said and done. It says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. So the guy was up and moving and he had gone into the temple probably to worship the Lord. And Jesus said this in John 5 verse 14, behold, you have become well. Then Jesus said this, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. So the implication is he was in the condition he was in because of some kind of sin that he had committed. And if you don't want to go back into that condition, Jesus says, leave the sin that puts you in that condition. We're not told what the sin was. So very clearly there in John 5, you have a circumstance like you have here in James 5, where uh, sin can lead to sickness of some kind. Now, when we build a doctrine, we don't just look at a verse or two. We look at everything God has to say on the subject, right? And if you only look at two verses of the Bible, John 5 and James 5, you'll come up with the idea that every time someone is sick, it's because of sin in their life. But that's not what all of God's Word says. I could show you a man in the Old Testament who was blameless and upright. Anybody know who I'm thinking of here? Job. And this guy, Job chapter 1, verse 1, was blameless and upright and fearing God and turning from evil. And this guy was so righteous that he would go out and he would offer uh, sacrifices and things of that nature, offerings for his sons, because he said, well, maybe my sons have sinned. So he, he wasn't worried about sin in his own life, worried about sin in the life of his kids. And he said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. And this Job did continually with these burnt offerings that he was offering up. So there is no um, record of any sin in Job's life. Yet, when he was struck by Satan, he became ill, didn't he? Job 2, verses 7 and 8 says, Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with severe boils, that's a skin issue, from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. And Job took a piece of pottery to scrape himself while he was sitting in the ashes. So he had a skin infirmity and it had nothing to do with sin in his life. Uh, some of the verses that I gave earlier, Paul suffered from frequent ailments. Uh, Galatians 4 verse 13. Or a bodily illness, I should say. Galatians 4 verse 13. Timothy, take a little wine for your frequent ailments. 1 Timothy 5.23. Trophimus, I left sick in Miletus, 2 Timothy 4, verse 20. Paul, a, a thorn in the flesh, could have been a physical ailment for all we know. He implored the Lord three times to take it away. God said no. So clearly, when, when you look at all of the things that happened with Paul's life, I mean, I, it's just hard for me to believe that Paul and his associates had these physical problems because of some pattern of sin. I mean, Paul walked with the Lord, just like Job did. So what is the totality of biblical teaching on the matter? The totality of biblical teaching on the matter is, yes, some people are sick because of sin in their life. 
But you shouldn't say to somebody who's suffering from a physical ailment, you're in that condition because your sin puts you in that condition. Because you don't know that. Because the Bible opens the door in the case of Job and in the case of Paul and Timothy for sickness to beset people even though there is no pattern of sin. So the reason I'm trying to be very careful with how we're explaining this is we get into the air of Job's counselors. Remember Job's counselors? Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And then if those guys weren't bad enough, another guy shows up later in the book named Elihu. And they are all so certain that Job had his problems because of unconfessed sin. When in reality, we've read the first two chapters of the book, Job's predicament had nothing to do with unconfessed sin. It's, it's sort of like the situation in John 9 where the disciples found a man uh, or they saw a man blind from birth. You remember what they said? Oh, who sinned? This man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. Remember that? But he was born this way so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So does sickness cause sin? It can. Is all sin attributable to sickness? Not necessarily. All of us are going to die at some point, don't you think? Um, you could be the most godly person in the world, but you're still going to die of something. Genesis 3 verse 19 says, from dust you are, to dust you shall what? Return. So obviously if that's true, you can't say so-and-so is ready to die because of sin in their life. The sin here that causes death is not their sin, but original sin, which has been transferred to them. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, Paul the Apostle said, Our outer man is decaying, yet we don't lose heart. I don't have to lose heart when my hair starts to go gray. If I've made a bunch of money as a model, which I haven't, and I'm the most beautiful person in the world, and my whole self-image is based on how I look, and I look in the mirror and I start to see wrinkles, I don't have to panic as a Christian. Because God says your outer man is the king, but guess what? Your inner man is what? It's being renewed. Romans 8 verses 19 through 23 says the whole universe, the whole creation is groaning right now. It's in a state of groaning because of Adam's sin. And who else is groaning? Are you groaning? You're groaning too. It's right there in Romans 8, 23. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Why am I groaning? Because I'm in a body that's decaying. And I'm waiting eagerly for our redemption as sons, the redemption of our body. So you wake up every morning and you sing the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say, can you see? The problem is, as you're singing it, you say, oh, longer as you get older. You wake up in the morning, you go, oh, I got to keep you guys awake somehow. So why, 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 is, why do you keep singing that song? Because your body is deteriorating. It's, it's, that's just a physical reality. And it has nothing to do with the fact that maybe I'm habitually living in sin or maybe I'm not. But the aging process is still taking place. So all of that to say, does uh, sin cause sickness? Yes, it does. Is every single sickness a person suffers 
attributable to sin. No, it's not. And so that's why I want to be careful as we look here at verse uh, 15. So all of that to say, different kinds of prayer. If you're afflicted, pray a prayer of dependence. If you're happy, pray a prayer of praise. If you're sick, summon the elders. And the elders will anoint your head with oil and lay hands on you. And if it's God's will, God will heal you. Then he describes here a fourth kind of prayer. And it's the prayer of confession. If you're in sin, pray a prayer of confession. And so notice what he says there in verse 16. Therefore, look at this now, confess your sins to one another. You mean I should go to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and confess my sins to them? I thought we believed in the priesthood of all believers. Because there's a lot of denominational hierarchies that will tell you that to get to God, you have to go through a priest. You've got to confess your sins to a priest to get to God. And if you're in that kind of a system, Roman Catholicism being an example, but there's other Protestant systems that teach the same kind of thing. They have a priesthood. They will quote to you verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. The, the fact of the matter is you don't have to do that as a Christian. You don't have to go through a man to get to God. Why is that? Because there is one mediator between God and man. And who would that person be? The man Christ Jesus. See, if you have a relationship with Jesus... You go through God the Son to God the Father under the direction of God the Holy Spirit, which means it's not necessary for you to go to a priest to get to God. Because the fact of the matter is, did you know this about yourself? You are a priest. Did you know that? You guys, I don't know, I don't know if you guys look very priestly out there. But you guys, I don't know if I look very priestly. Where's my vestments? Where's my robe? Well, the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter how I look, how I feel. If I'm a New Testament Christian and a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I already am a priest. Revelation 1.6 says he has made us. Now that's John writing. You know, John says you, his audience, have the same privileges I have. He has made us to be a kingdom of priests. To his God and Father, to him be the glory and, and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then in Revelation 5 verse 10, it says you have made them to be a kingdom of priests. To our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So you're a priest now and you're destined for authority as a priest in the future millennial kingdom. So once you start to understand that, then you start to understand that you don't have to go through a man or a person or a denomination to get to God. It's sort of like when uh, you know I go out to lunch with people after church and uh, we're sitting there at the table and the food comes and everybody's kind of awkwardly waiting for someone to pray. Because we want to pray so we can eat, amen? And if I'm in the group, they'll, they'll all look at me like it's my responsibility to pray. Well, you're the pastor. Shouldn't you pray? By the way, I don't mind praying at all. It's a privilege. But you don't have to wait for me to pray. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. You have the same privileges with God that I have. Because God has made all of us priests. So you pray. You pray and I'll eat. How's that? And a better deal is you pr pray and you pay and then I'll eat. How's that? No, I'm just joking on there. But, you know, th th these verses, I'm going through them carefully because they're distorted. 
However, if all of that is true, and all of us can go to God on our own, then why in the world would verse 16 say, therefore confess your sins to one another? Well, there might be a special circumstance where you need to do that. For example, you might have offended somebody. You might have sinned against somebody. Now, when the Bible says we've done that, in Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, it says we should rectify with our brother or sister whom we have offended first before we come to worship the Lord. Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught this. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar, go and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So it might be a circumstance where you're going to church or you're going to pray or you're going to worship the Lord, but you remember that you offended somebody or said something about somebody that's not right or whatever the circumstance is. The Lord says, I want you to go get reconciled horizontally first before you approach me vertically. That's what he's saying. So there may be circumstances like that where you have to, you have the need to confess your sins one to another. But it's not saying that you can't get to God unless you have a priest, because you are a priest already. In Israel, the priests came from which tribe? Levi. So not anybody could be a priest in the Old Testament. You had to be born from Aaron, first of all, a Levite, but from Aaron's line. So not everybody in Old Testament Israel was a priest. The priests were a special group of people. But that's not how it works in the church age. In the age of the church, all of us are priests. And so there is no need to go through Aaron or Aaron's sons or some sort of man-made system to get to God because you already are a priest. So don't confuse this verse with teaching some sort of limited priesthood. That's not what it's teaching. What it's Because we believe in the priesthood of all believers. By the way, one of the greatest proponents of the priesthood of all believers was Martin Luther the church reformer. He really stressed that. That's why Luther came up with the German translation of Greek and Hebrew Bible. He spent, I think, around 11 weeks or 11 months, something like that, translating the Greek into German for the German people. And then he spent 11 years translating the Hebrew and the Aramaic into Luther's German translation. Now, why would a man do that? Because he believed in the priesthood of all believers, which Roman Catholicism that he was reacting against for the past thousand years didn't agree with. Because all over Europe, prior to the Reformation, people had no access to the Bible. In fact, the Bible was chained to the pulpits. And the people were told, you're not qualified to understand the Bible. And how could you understand it anyway, since it was the Latin Vulgate, and the people didn't speak Latin. And the service was in Latin. So if you really wanted to understand God, you had to go through a priest to get to God. You had to get all of your understanding of God through a priest. And the problem is the priests abuse their authority 
by teaching the people doctrines such as when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Johann Tetzel taught that. And that's how the Roman Catholic Church became so phenomenally wealthy. I've been to Vatican City and toured it. You would not believe the wealth they have in that place. And they got that wealth by teaching that to people and swindling them out of their money for over a millennium. Over a thousand years they did that. So when the Protestant Reformation started, Luther hated that. He hated what is called the sale of indulgences. And he built from the scripture using verses like this, Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, Revelation chapter 5 verse 10, the concept of the priesthood of all believers. And that's why he was so, that's why he spent years and years of his life translating the Bible from the original languages into German so the people could have a Bible because they didn't have any such thing before. Um, so all of that to say, we've got a rich heritage and we're all priests. So don't think you have to go to a priest to get to God because you are a priest. Um, but at the same time, there might be circumstances where you would want to confess your sins to somebody. Like in the circumstance I'm talking about where you have to get right with somebody horizontally before you can approach God um, Approach God vertically. So is anybody afflicted? Pray a prayer of dependence. Is anybody happy? Pray a prayer of praise. Is anybody sick? Get the elders of the church to come and anoint his or her head with oil. And that person, if it's God's will for them to be healed, will be raised up. Is anybody in sin? Maybe they need to pray a prayer of confession to a fellow brother or sister in Christ that they've offended. And then there's a last one here. It's sort of a repeat of verse uh, 14. But is anybody sick? They should call for intercessory prayer. So look at verse uh, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So there might be a circumstance where you look at a fellow brother or sister in Christ and they're really suffering. You know, they're, they're physically suffering or something. And so when James says, when you see that happen, don't just um, feel sorry for them. I mean, feeling sorry for them is a good step, right? I mean, God help us if we don't have compassion for each other. But allow that emotion of compassion to translate into prayer. And actually intercede for them in prayer without them even knowing you're interceding for them. So that's a wonderful way to, to pray. You, you think about people that are having problems. And what you can do is you could say, you know, Lord, I just feel terrible for so-and-so, and you just go to the Lord and pray for them. This is, a, this is a different kind of prayer life. I mean, my prayer life's not all about me. Because a lot of times when we pray, we're pretty much thinking of ourselves. And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. We all have needs. But I think a healthy, or it doesn't matter what I think, what James says... A healthy prayer life also involves intercessory prayer for others. So you, so you look at these verses and they're just wonderful because they give you all of these circumstances and all of these different kinds of prayers that apply to different circumstances. If you're afflicted, pray a prayer of dependence. If you're happy, pray a prayer of praise. If you're sick, summon the elders to pray for you. If you've offended somebody, pray a prayer of confession or confess your sins to them. And if you see someone that's sick, maybe it's an opportunity for intercessory prayer. Now, next week, which is our last meeting of the spring quarter, is, is prayer, does it really work? I mean, you go to the Lord in prayer, I mean, does it really work? 
And we're going to see an answer to that in verses 16 through 18. And then the book of James is going to end with, how do you restore the erring brother or sister? So somebody has wandered off the path of Christianity. How do you bring them back onto the right path? A lot of parents are in that circumstance with their kids, by the way. Kids go off to college, they dump Jesus. How do you bring them back? And so there's some information about that at the end of chapter 5. So we're going to try to wrap up uh, the book of James next week. And if you guys haven't enjoyed it, it doesn't matter because I've had a great time <laughs> studying all this stuff and trying to learn it. So at this time, uh, if you've got to take off or otherwise pick up your kids, that would be, this would be.